right, so I have a 7 30 seconds drill bit in here, um, which is the uh, which is the the tip of my counterbore. So it's the same width as the tip of my counterbore. Leaves um, plenty of room uh, for the for the machine screw. The machine screw is like 183 thousandths. So this is 200 I think 16 or 17. It's going to leave me plenty of room. It's going to leave me uh, 17, like 34 thousandths. So that's 17 thousandths all the way around um, the actual size of the machine screw. So I'm going to go in through the front first because I don't want it to uh, chip out when I drill through the back. So here we go. I let the drill bit find the center. Um, you'll see the body wiggle a little bit. I mean, you got to get it close, but. It finds itself. Still centered. I drill these first two top ones. Then I put this in there. Acts as a pin, so it doesn't move. The neck is where it's supposed to be. Um, once I get this in, I move the clamps up. Keep this in here. The clamps out of the way. I'm able to drill the other. I have the seven thirty seconds um, drill bit in here. I got a piece of tape, so it'll go in as far as uh, I want it to. I stop when it brushes on the tape. Um, it's only going in maybe a quarter of an inch because I'm going to take it when I take it off. I'm going to use those pilots. I'm going to put it on the drill press, set my depth. Um, thing is, when you're drilling holes, is the drill bit wants to suck you in. So you don't want to try to take it to your exact depth um, because uh, <laughs> you risk going through the front of the, the fingerboard. check make sure that neck is still where it's supposed to be and it is and I'm gonna come into the other holes that's the start I put one slip of tape around the neck because um, that's the minimal amount of clearance I want. This tape's about three thousandths of an inch, so that's three thousand each side in the front. I'll probably end up with like six or seven thousandths of paint on here. In the finished sanding process, this is gonna end up being that, and then uh, the lacquer is gonna make up the difference, and it's gonna be a snug, not super tight neck pocket. So I put some uh, gasket cork and taped it to the edges to keep the neck from rolling, okay, uh, when I'm drilling this to the proper depth. Um, this is a 7 30 seconds drill bit, taking these pilot holes to the depth that I want them. Um, I've set the depth stop on this when we go down to where I need it. And then to keep it square, I take this piece of tissue paper put it under here so it's... It's not gonna tilt back or roll. All right, here we go. So 
So I've set the counter bore to a depth of 15, 30 seconds. It's going to follow this pilot hole, these pilot holes, and stop at 15, 30 seconds. I have it resting on a nine and a half radius block centered on it so it doesn't tilt either way. So here we go. There you go. Counterboard baby. Ready to get tapped. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to tap them. This is a tap. Uh, here's the insert. The tap is a 3 8 16 NC GH3. I've got two of them. One's got a sharp tip. One's got a flat tip. This gets the this will thread to the bottom of the hole. The inserts, um, this tool uh, allows you to screw the insert in. Um, you use a flat head, not as good. This little nipple, and then these little tabs on here really hold on to it well. Um, I ground it down so it doesn't rub on the threads uh, and chew up the wood threads. This here is a wooden block. I believe it's an inch thick. Um, I pre-tapped it. I double-sided tape sandpaper on the back. This way, when I put it in place, it's not going to want to wander on me. It's like literally stuck there. So I've pre-threaded my tap into the block. It's only sticking out maybe a quarter of an inch. Um, the reason I don't clamp this into place um, is because uh, if I got to wiggle it a little bit to center it, um, I can do so. I have this nine and a half, nine and a half inch radius Stumac 18 inch uh, sanding block and I have it clamped here. It's This thing's not going anywhere. Now, it's giving me, it's fighting me a little bit. So that means I'm getting, I've gotten to the bottom of the hole. The, the fact that I have resistance, if I keep cranking down on it, it'll go a little bit, but then what it'll do is it'll just tear out the threads. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to back this out. You notice how I held it down with my thumb? Keep the block from lifting and it going in at a funky angle. Now I'm going to change it to the flat bottom one, but what I'm going to do is I'm not going to take this out of the block. Why am I not going to do that? Because the tap has already been started. The threads have already been started and um, I don't have to worry about them pitching this way, pitching this way. It's going to grab. Um, so instead of taking this out of the block, I loosen my tap holder. And I go for the flat bottom one. Get it in there. Tighten her up. Now I have sawdust in here. Okay, so I'm going to knock it out. You'll see how much comes out. So that's all where the threads came out. Now it's just going in there nice and smooth. You see that? It's pretty much doing all the work. I used to freehand these, and uh, yeah. That's about it. Now I I put my fingers on the rip like that, <laughs> kind of like cigarette and I keep this because once you get to the end this is a particularly heavy handle and I like the heavy handle because this is rock maple 
And it, you know it did something because one came out. So it got to the bottom of it. I think you can see it. Yeah, you see the threads? Yeah. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the insert. All right, so this is like, and backwards, uh, a Husky. It's got a quarter inch, you know, adapter, like normal bits. Slides right in there like that. See the tip? See that tip? Goes in. And it locks in real nice. Look at that. No resistance. No resistance. So now I'm getting to the bottom. It feels kind of snug, right? And what you're going to hear, not crackling, but like uh, like a frictiony pop. Like, right? Right there. Once you hear like a click or two, that's what you want to do. Because if you tighten it too far down, this bottom's out. So that's it. Like that's as far as I'm going down, right? Um, if you over tighten it, and I've done it on practice pieces because I wanted to see what would happen if you over tighten it, this insert pushes down. It hits the bottom of the hole. And then from the bottom of the hole to where the insert is, the insert starts to, you, it, it'll split the wood right where at the bottom of the, the insert goes. The insert is only yay big. That's about that. Of the insert, this is sticking out about an inch and three eighths. That's from the top of the insert to the top of the screw. The insert is buried. I can't see because I'm old now, but almost a sixteenth of an inch, like a thirty, like so, like three sixty fourths. That's just the top of this. So, the, like, that's the first thread. Um, you don't have to worry about these things pulling out. I don't like to bury them too much. But because I drilled a pilot hole that goes extends past the bottom of the insert. That is it. I have hit, I have hit the bottom of that hole. Top of the dome looks like an inch and a sixteenth, and then you add three sixty fourths. So. So an inch and seven sixty fourths. The neck pocket. You add the plate. You add the the, the the meat underneath the neck pocket. This is never gonna bottom out like this. And see how nicely it just spins in there. And it's strong. That's how you install the Ventique neck insert. It's a great product. Uh, I use it on all my bolt-ons. I would never put a wood screw in a guitar ever again. This thing increases sustain. It alleviates a lot of problems. Um, on a Strat or a Tele, these are a little closer to the edge of the edges of the neck, um, but it's nothing to worry about. It's a great product. I love it. All right, this is neck number two. I'm gonna do all of them and put the inserts in. And you're gonna see how relatively easy this is.
You gotta knock the sawdust out. Raining money right there. All you repair guys out there. It's a good way to make money. As long as you don't fuck it up. See how it just finds the thread? You just gotta be gentle. And then it's just, I'm spinning it one handed. Then when I get to the end, sometimes I'll back it out a little more. That's it. Sometimes you find it a little easier. Now I like going to the center here because there's a lot of leverage on here. You can, you really feel it better in the center. I'm threading it. I definitely support this. I don't pull up, but I don't let it wobble either. Go to the, I hear that first little crack. That's it. Yeah, this one I might go a little bit more. Nah, it's on there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to back one out to show you how easy it is. One fails. That's it. That's why you don't glue them in. This is some, not all of the uh, hardware offered by Vintique Guitars. So there's a variety of Basically, Telecaster and Stratocaster parts, P bass, Fender style basses. Uh, so, this is a bass bridge. It's engine turned. It's got holes for strings and then the saddles. Um, I do not believe he makes the brass saddles for those. Uh, 
because they don't have to be compensated. And he told me that um, you can, you know, get them plenty of places aftermarket. There's no reason for them to make. These are the uh, neck plates that you get. Um, this is just a plain polish. This is also engine turn. Um, these are the inserts and the stainless steel machine screws that you receive with each neck plate. These are his old knobs. They're a little shorter. These are his newer knobs. Heavy knurled. Comes with a stainless steel screw. They're the finest Telecaster knobs that I've ever used. This is my personal guitar. This is a Fender Japanese 62 Custom reissue I got when I was in the 10th grade. This is one of his bridges. Uh, this is, I believe, bead blasted. I do not know whether he offers that anymore. As you can see, these are brass compensated saddles. Stainless steel screws. These saddles do not touch each other. So you're not getting like what, what he calls crosstalk. The bottoms of these are ground flat, so you can get even lower if you like low action. A lot of the ones you, that, that are made now, uh, the bottoms aren't ground flat. Stainless steel springs, stainless steel machine screws. This, these things, you're never gonna hear rattle from a spring. He, what comes with the kit, stainless steel mounting screws. Also, what's cool about this, is there's screw holes for the front, because a lot of times with a Telecaster bridge, it likes to lift, lift forward. Um, it also comes with springs and screws for your, for your pickup. He makes uh, control cavity plates. This is not one of his control cavity plates. Basically everything you can get, you can get engine turned. You can get this engine turned, you can get this engine turned, obviously these parts engine turned. These are my pickups, I made these. His bridges are 62 thousandths of an inch, which is what the old vintage ones were, but these are stainless. Um, like I said, the bottom's ground flat. This is a cutaway, so when you wanna do uh, like volume swell, it allows clearance for your pick. When you pick, and then do your volume swell, this lip doesn't get in the way. The control plates are 62 thousandths thick. Neck plates are between 92 and 100 thousandths thick. That's so when you tighten it down, a lot of times with old fender plates, the corners would bend in and you chip out paint. These things don't go anywhere. Uh, another thing he does is he makes a thing called a tone block, and it's, it's like oval, like this. It fastens like in between uh, the bridge and the, and, and the body, with machine screws that come in from the bridge side. The ferrules are drilled into it, so it's this oval thing. So you, you have to route a cavity for it. 